Haideți să deschidem cuvântul lui Dumnezeu la Efeseni, capitolul 6, versetul 10 și 11. În această seară o să privim aceste versete și la un subiect frumos și anume creștinul victorios. Creștinul victorios. O să citesc în limba engleză Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, uh, with a good size uh, of young people from our community, we went down to Phoenix for the youth convention and the Lord indeed blessed us with uh, a good time. His presence was felt in that place and uh, the organizing church, Happy Valley, with their pastor are sending warm greetings to all of you. And uh, the Lord helped us to serve over there, whether through music or the messages. Brother Leonard was there and myself were involved with teaching and preaching. And uh, the message, the theme that I had to share was the victorious Christian. And time, of course, was short, 25 minutes. And in the past few days, I've been meditating on that theme, on that subject. And I've realized that the victorious Christian is such a grand, such a great theme that it, it demands, it should be explained in more than 25 minutes. That's why it's my plan throughout the summer, or at least half of the summer, whenever I will have a chance to be up here and sharing the word, I will do my best to explain what a victorious Christian looks like. And I will be paying attention to Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10 to 18. Now, when you look in the Bible, from especially from Matthew all the way to Revelation, you will find the word victory, victorious, as something that describes the people of God. Victory was not for the emperor from Rome. Nowhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, you will find the emperor as being the one who has victory. No, you will find the Christian, me and you, being victorious. If you look in the book of Revelation, which I remind you is the last book of the Bible, it speaks about the end, the way things will end. We are presented in that book as victorious overcomers. If you remember when John addresses, when God actually through John addresses the seven churches, there are seven promises. The one who overcomes shall have so and so. Cel care va birui va primi. Va primi, va primi. De șapte ori. And then throughout the book of Revelation, you will find this amazing concept. The Christian is destined for victory because we belong to Christ and his people are not losers. We are not losers. We are victorious. Victorious. Not only that, but when you look around in our lives, when I look in my life, when I look in your lives, the way you live, the way you breathe, the way you uh, walk, run the race, um, many times I, I, I do not see victory. I don't know about you necessarily, but let me, let me speak about myself tonight. I wish I would be victorious all the time. But many times we fall, many times I realize, Lord, I look like a loser, I look like I'm defeated, what do I do? 
And as we're going to look at these passages, at these verses, we're going to realize that we are destined for victory. We are meant to be victorious. All right? So this is a great team. Hopefully um, in the next three, four uh, messages throughout the summer, we will explore it. Let me say at this point that according to Ephesians chapter 6, there are two things, two points that we are supposed to be uh, victorious. There are two things offered to us, and they are clearly presented in verse 10 and 11. Please pay attention. The first one in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And the second one in verse 11, put on, put on the whole armor of God, the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We are supposed to stay strong in the Lord. And then we are supposed to put on the whole armor of God. And then from verse 12 all the way to 18, Paul will describe what the armor of God looks like. But you see, those two come together. We cannot separate them. Number one, I'm supposed to stay strong in the Lord and in his power. And number two, I'm supposed to do something. I'm supposed to put on the equipment, the armor of God. I'm a soldier of Christ, and therefore he has an equipment ready for you and me. Those two go together. We cannot live just by one. We cannot accept just the first one and then ignore the second one because very often I've noticed here in North America, we are so fond, we love the first part. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And this is wonderful because it's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus, what he did for us. But we do not focus on the second part, which is to put on the whole armor of God. If I may say the first one, it talks about our being, who we are. The second one about our doing, what we do. So the first one, be someone, be somebody. Second, do something. You are supposed to do something. That is a complete Christian, a victorious Christian. Please observe also in these uh, preliminary observations that the order is very significant. What's the first one? Be strong in the Lord. Prima este fiți tari în Domnul. Apoi puneți armătura lui Dumnezeu pe voi. Please understand the word that that is so important. Because the armor of God can be comprehended, understood only by Christians, only by those who are in Christ Jesus. If I present this wonderful armor of God to an unbeliever, to him is like, I, I don't need it. There's no use. This is meant only for Christians for believers. That's why in verse 10 we are told, finally, my brethren, my brethren. Tonight, let's speak about the first part, which is be strong in the Lord, the being part. We are supposed to be something. The description of the victorious Christian first is being in the Lord. Your identity my identity. Please observe that phrase, in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it's very interesting that in the book of Ephesians, you will find this phrase, in the Lord, in Christ, in Jesus, 27 times. 27 times, and it refers to you and me. It refers to the believers. We are 
in Christ. We are in the Lord positionally. We are in him. But then throughout the New Testament, you will find this 160 times. One, six, zero. And again, it refers to you and me. Because our position is in Christ. My identity is in him and in everything that he has accomplished for us. And that is so, so important. Why be strong in the Lord? Number one, because the enemy is powerful. The enemy is strong. Our enemy is not weak. Our enemy is not um, someone that has no power, no authority on planet Earth. Of course, he is defeated by the Lord. Of course, uh, he is still under the dominion of God the Father. But friends, he has power on planet Earth. Pay attention to verse 12. For we do not wrestle, we do not fight, we do not battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is a word that we fight, we battle, and it's in the heavenly places. My battle, your battle, is not against flesh and blood. No, oh, we battle the devil. And that, that in, in a sense, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of like a bad news for some of us. Because we understand the Christian life as a, a, a beautiful spiritual retreat where we enjoy peace and tranquility and everything is nice and, and pink and rose and blue. Um, when you read passages like this, you realize, oh my goodness, I have to fight. Someone is against me. Someone hates me. Someone it, it just hates my family, my faith. Because if you pay attention to verse 12, six times you will find the word against. 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 Împotriva, împotriva, împotriva. Someone, friends, is against you and me. I have a good quote here that I want to present to you. We must live in light of the fact that just as much as God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, so it is true that Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. We love the first part, don't we? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And if you stop there, it's all good news, it's wonderful. Uh, but then you read throughout the Bible and you realize that Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. So that's why we have to be strong in the Lord. Because the enemy is powerful, he's strong. The enemy has... About seven, six thousand years of experience. And you are next in line, customer, 10 billion and something. Do you realize that? You are customer number 10 or 11 billion. He's got experience. He knows what he's doing. And I'm telling you, I don't know about you. But I will never go to a gunfight with a knife. Although I, I'm not a big fan of guns, please do not misunderstand me. I, li I believe a Christian should live by the Sermon on the Mountain, uh, not necessarily by the Second Amendment. However, if you want to enforce it, that is up to you. Your business, we end here. The point is this, I will never go to a gunfight with a knife. Nor would you. We are better than that. We realize we are no match. We have no chance. We need a gun. Don't we? That's why we are supposed to be strong in the Lord. We are supposed to be strong in the Lord. Because the enemy is powerful. is strong. Number two. I'm supposed to be strong in the Lord because we are weak. We are weak. The devil is strong, and we are so weak. Do you realize this, that in the Bible we are 
um, resembled, we are given as an example as being like sheeps, sheeps, lambs. And as far as I know, sheeps are um, quite uh, not smart. I don't want to use a different word that came to my mind right now, but uh, they are not smart. Uh, they are quite weak. They have no idea at times where they are going. They depend so much on the shepherd. And we are sheep. Are you aware that in the Bible, the devil is likened not as a sheep, but as a roaring lion? Please pay attention to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's the devil. He's a roaring lion, defeated, of course, but still he makes noise. And we are just like sheep in the Bible. Although we will see that when we put the full armor of God on us, we are better than lions. We are better than lions. Number two, so we are supposed to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because we are weak. We are feeble. We do not have power on our own. We cannot do it. We need more than ourselves. We need the Lord on our side. Number three, we are supposed to be strong in the Lord because the Lord indeed, he is strong. You see, when I go to that gunfight, I don't have a knife. I have the Lord on my side. I have Jesus on my side. And he's better than AK-47 or whatever guns we may have, spiritually speaking, of course. Again, do not misunderstand me. Having the Lord on your side is better than your gifts, talents, wisdom, understanding, and on and on and on. The Lord indeed is strong. And he invites us to participate in his victory. That's why in Corinthians we are told that he carries us in his chariot of victory. El ne poartă în carul lui de biruință în Hristos Iisus. We are with the Lord in his chariot and he's the one who's in charge, who's in control. We are behind. Truth be told, we are behind. We do not. We do not lead. We do not drive the chariot. He's the one in charge. But we are in his chariot of victory, of triumph. We are in the Lord. Yes, the Lord indeed is strong, he's mighty, he's powerful. And I found that the Lord is strong in three areas. Where do I see his strength? Number one, in his life. Number two, in his death. And number three, in his resurrection, the Lord is strong and powerful. Number one, the Lord is strong when I look at his life, his teaching, his preaching. Matthew chapter 7 the greatest sermon ever spoken on planet earth or preached the Sermon on the Mountain, uh, the people, they were astonished, amazed, and they said, we never heard anybody preach, teach like Jesus Christ. Why? Because he spoke with power. That's what the gospel says. There is power in the teaching of Christ. There is power also in the miracles of Christ. When you read the four Gospels, you will see that there is absolutely nothing that will stand against Christ and not be conquered, not be overcome. I remind myself many times when I read the Gospels that indeed in the history of humanity, in the, in the, in the story of the Bible, the first one to cast out devils, demons, was Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, you see all types of miracles, Moses and, and Elijah and Elisha and Daniel, Isaiah and on and on. Those people, they are accomplished, they have accomplished a lot through the power of God, but none of them cast out demons. It was Christ the Lord, the first one. So yes, Jesus is strong. Jesus is powerful. When I look at his life, his miracles. 
Christ is strong also when I look at his temptations because Jesus Christ was tempted just like you and me. And yet, he was victorious. He overcame. And then, Christ is strong. I see his strength when, when I look at his death on the cross. And there is a verse in the Bible that, in my opinion, is one of the most neglected verses out of the entire Bible. If you go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, this is one of the most neglected truths out of the entire Bible. For some reason, we never pay attention to it. For some reason, we never take this verse to bring it to reality in our lives. Second, Col Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Look what happened at the cross. And I like to tell myself there were three things nailed on the cross. There were three things nailed on the cross. In fact, there were four. Number one, it was the sign above the head of Christ. Remember the sign in three languages. This is the king of the Jews. It was in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Number two, Jesus Christ was nailed on the cross. Yes, that is correct. What was the third thing that was nailed on the cross? Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. The third thing being nailed on the cross having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Christ took it away, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay, there was a list with accusations. Count number one, Marius Antiviano, you are a liar. Count number two, Marius Antiviano, you are on and on and on. All those accusations, and, and that's for you and, and all humanity. And Paul says in this verse that Christ took this book to the cross and he nailed it. Friends, my sins were nailed on the cross. Those accusations were nailed on the cross. That's why through the death of Christ, I am alive. That's why through the death of Christ, I am more than victorious in Christ. The fourth thing, al patrulea lucru care a fost crucificat, care a fost bătut în cuie, mai bine zis, al patrulea lucru care a fost bătut în cuie, acolo în versetul 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, I like this word, disarmed. Le-a dezarmat. The principalities and the powers. He made the public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. And if you read different translations, you will find this. He nailed them to the cross. That's the fourth thing being nailed to on the cross. The devil with his power, principalities and powers. This is why, yes, I am supposed to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and his strength. Number three, yes, the Lord is strong when I look at his resurrection because the resurrection speaks about power and he invites us in his victory to participate in that life that we have in him. Friends, as we conclude tonight, I want you to understand this. That before we do something in order to be victorious, we need to be something. We need to be something. And yes, through faith in Christ and through repentance and through a prayer by faith, we can be in Christ. We can be part of the army of Christ. In the following weeks, we will focus on what we do, putting on the whole armor of God. But this is the foundation. We cannot move on without this foundation. I need to be in Christ. You need to be in Christ. And this can happen tonight. Through prayer. If you are not in Christ, if you do not have the life 
that is in him, I'm afraid for you because you don't stand a chance against the devil. You see, in 1 Peter 5, 8, we read that the lion, the roaring lion, the devil is walking around seeking whom he may devour. What would you do if tonight on the way home as you drive, you listen on the radio, and they say um, a lion escaped from the local zoo? And this lion is just crazy. He, I don't know, he has Alzheimer or something. He just forgot <laughs> he's supposed to be nice to people, you know. Uh, and they say, warning, danger. Uh, and in fact, they say over the radio, this lion was last spotted on, uh, on your street, right around your house, in your neighborhood. Uh, can I ask you, how would you park your car on the driveway? How would you proceed <laughs> to, <laughs> to move from the car <laughs> to the house? If you have a gun, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to grab it. <laughs> well, you're going to enforce the Second Amendment. That's it, <laughs> the right to bear arms. Um, if you don't have a gun, probably you, you look around, you'll grab something, um, you'll be extra careful, um, and then you'll just, you'll, just, you'll just go fast, fast. And in fact, I don't think I'm going to get out of the car. I think I'm going to drive somewhere else, drink a coffee or a cup of tea, and then go home when everything is settled, when they found the lion. Friends, let me tell you something. There is a lion in the neighborhood. There is a lion in the neighborhood. And if I don't dare face a physical lion without a gun or something, I don't dare face the lion, the devil, without something in my hands. And I'm telling you, I have in my hands this victory in Christ. I am in him. My identity is in Jesus. And yes, I am commanded to put on the whole armor of God, to be militarily equipped for war. But till then, my identity is in Christ. And therefore, tonight, if the devil comes and knocks at the door of my heart, I'm supposed to let Jesus go answer. I'm supposed to let Jesus, I do not have power to deal with the devil. I don't have power to answer that knock. You go deal with him. And if I am sincere in my heart, Christ will do it. Because I am in him and he is in me. And Christ has no losers. Christ has victorious people. May the Lord bless us. Amen.